Um, and our next speaker is Roland Harwood, the co-founder of 100% Open. The openness theme continues. He's going to talk about hands-on open innovation. Roland. Thank you. Thanks, Rory. Hi, everybody. Great to be here. I am. Um, I'm, I'm curious. How many people work for a small? Startup or a planning when you graduate, whatever, to kind of work for an entrepreneurial company as opposed to a big company like PG. So, who, who works in a small company? Fantastic. Okay, that's interesting. Sort of more than half, I'd say. So, I am, um, uh, a few people have revealed kind of uh, a little bit about themselves. I graduated from a degree in physics just as the dot com uh, bubble was bursting. Um, the career choices for a physicist 10 years ago were essentially become an academic or go to the city and earn loads of money. I wasn't motivated to do either of those things, but for some reason uh, I didn't quite pick up the courage to found my own venture until 18 months ago, but I'm very glad I did and I'm pleased to see that I think more people raise their hands in the room here than they would have 10 years ago as some of the other guys have said. So, um, so I want to build on a couple of themes that the other speakers have spoken about. Um, so Rory was talking about technology giving some demos, which is always dangerous. Uh, I think technology by definition is imperfect. Uh, if, it, if it wasn't, it would just be called stuff. So um, I think that is interesting. And I'm most interested in the kind of social and organizational uh, response and innovation that follows technological innovation like the internet, often 20, 30, 40, 50 years later. And I think we're only just starting to see how organizations are responding to globalization and the kind of network world. Um, <coughs> Cambridge. Uh, I come here a lot. I like it very much. I get a sense that everybody knows everybody. It's, it feels like it's a small world, which I think is almost certainly a fantastic thing to get stuff done. Um, but I heard a great quote the other day from a guy at Telegraph saying, uh, the world isn't getting smaller, the network's are getting bigger. And uh, I just think that that is good. And I want to pick up on some of the things that Ted talked about, about kind of networks. Uh, and finally, kind of to build on, on, on Mike's theme of openness and open innovation, uh, we're called 100% Open. My question is, how open are you now? And how, how open do you think you, you want to be and need to be? Uh, that's not something I can do with a show of hands, but I pose that question and I'm interested uh, in your response. I, my gut feeling there is the personal journey that I've been on in terms of being a complete social media addict on Twitter and etc. I'm Roland Harvard on Twitter, if you want to send me a tweet, is uh, I personally share a lot more than I thought I would kind of five years ago. I think a lot of people uh, feel the same. There's a lot of value in doing that commercially, but also personally. Um, and I think organisations are only just beginning to scratch the surface. So I want to give a whole bunch of examples there. I'm going to run through the first few slides very quickly. Our definition of open innovation is as follows. Very, very simple. Innovating with partners. Sharing risk. Generally people are pretty happy with that because risk is bad. But sharing reward, people are less happy with because that's what we're all you know, in it to win it. Now, um, I think there's a... There's a spectrum or a spiral, uh, in my case, uh, here of progressively more open business models from the traditional closed models of sort of R&D, market research, um, through to more cooperative business models where you're seeing the rise of crowdsourcing and sort of ideas competitions, uh, which is quite interesting. Then, then, then you get progressively more open, more collaborative in terms of sharing intellectual property, either licensing it out or buying it in or doing various kind of co-branded partnerships. And then, uh, this is Buzzword Bingo, of course, the co-creation uh, kind of stage, uh, which is uh, all about kind of some kind of joint venture, progressing right through to Creative Commons. Do people know what Creative Commons is? And open source, that, that, that kind of the most open business models that there are. So I think uh, when most of the organizations that I'm going to talk about are just at the start of this spiral, but I think there's a there's large pressure to kind of forces out of this, so I just thought I'd kick start with that. Um, which brings me to networks, which has, still has a dirty uh, um, connotation. I love this quote from Chris Powell, uh, former chairman of uh, an organisation I used to work for called Nesta, where he would say, networking is only one letter away from not working, and uh, it's kind of seen as, um, I don't know, uh, just not a good thing. But I would like to make the case that uh, the 21st century innovator, be it an individual or an organisation, uh, your network is as important, if not more important, than your know-how. I think knowledge 
is becoming commodified, it's becoming ubiquitous. You can, you can Google anything, that's not to say that we don't value deep expertise, but I think we undervalue the importance of networks in getting stuff done. And that's why I think a place like Cambridge is kind of really powerful that you know, people do know each other. But it's not, um, uh, it's not a global panacea, and I'm, I'm going to pick up on some of those things as well. So this, uh, uh, this quote, uh, quite famous now, uh, from Bill Joy at Sun, not all the smart people work for you. In fact, regardless of the size of your organisation, be it 100% open or P&G, 99.999% of the smart people don't work for you. So therefore, if you have a strategy around innovation, most organisations don't. Uh, I think basically you're an idiot unless you engage the outside world. That's not quite how we pitch it to clients, but that's pretty much, uh, that's, that's pretty much the case. Um, and a company that we're working with now, we're complete Lego fanboys, are very excited to be working with them, but uh, is Lego, who are some reluctant pioneers in this space. And uh, one of the reasons for this, and many of you may know the story of Lego Mindstorms, is any, any Lego Mindstorms kind of fans in the room? Is anybody? Okay, oh, we've got Tim over there, and a few people. Um, so Mindstorms are robots uh, programmed by, by chips targeted mainly at teenagers and adults, and um, incidentally, uh, adults are the fastest growing uh, customer segment in, in LEGO's uh, customer base. Uh, so uh, Mindstorms was developed by an in-house team of 10 people 10 years ago, and within about a week of the launch of the new product, there were tens of thousands of people talking about the product in various online kind of geeky LEGO fan communities, um, which is great for you know, building buzz and all that kind of stuff, but uh, more interestingly is a whole bunch of uh, subset of those fans had hacked into the code that this core team had developed to program the robots and were making the robots do different stuff that the original team hadn't thought of and they were making the code run faster and better and smoother. So in short, these people were innovating on LEGO's product, uh, but, um, but, but, but uh, they were strictly speaking infringing LEGO's copyright and LEGO did quite seriously at the time think about should we try and stop this. Remember this is kind of pre-Facebook, pre-Wikipedia, so this kind of online kind of activity was perhaps less uh, well understood than it is now. Uh, but to cut a long story short, this happened so fast and LEGO knew there was something interesting here, so they ran with it and it's become their most successful product of all time. Uh, but the reason why I start with LEGO is because it's really shifted their mindset from about how they innovate, from a place where they were, and still are, I think, the world's kind of best toy manufacturer to a point where the, the way they innovate isn't around their manufacturing or creative capabilities, it's about facilitating and enabling fans to, to build kind of brilliant stuff with their bricks and with their products and, and, and with, with what they offer. So it's building, as Google say, platforms, not products. Uh, I think that's a, a mantra that Lego is trying to as well. Um, uh, one of our lessons learned uh, um, is born out very much in the digital world, which is around engaging your top 1%, this idea of lead users. So um, it's uh, for on, on YouTube, say, for every 100 people that watch a YouTube clip, uh, you'll get uh, sort of one person who will create or upload a new, uh, uh, a new, a, a new video, uh, and about 10% of the people will, will comment uh, or, or sort of contribute in another way. The same applies on Wikipedia, the same applies in lots of online environments, it's called the 1990 rule. Uh, but the reason why it's important and interesting to engage the top 1% is they are often motivated uh, to, to innovate uh, um, because of a, uh, an unmet need that they want to do something about. So my favourite example of this, if you permit me a quick anecdote, is in the early 20th century, um, if you were diabetic, uh, you had to essentially commute to a doctor twi uh, once a day, I think, to be injected with, with insulin. Uh, and this was such a pain in the neck for uh, one particular individual, whose name escapes me, that um, he decided to train for seven years to be a medical doctor himself just so he could inject himself, uh, so he wouldn't have to do this commute every day. And then he campaigned that other diabetics should be able to do the same. Uh, and so the self-injection of insulin was born, which is a, you know, a major step forward in terms of managing uh, a health condition. Uh, now, the vast majority of people you know, can't be bothered, frankly, to train for seven years to be a doctor because of this. But you know, it's down to individuals like that that, that push, drive forward kind of big change, and I think uh, that is an interesting place to look. So sometimes, as in the case of Virgin Atlantic that we worked with recently, your top 1% are quite visible, they're your most free, uh, your, uh, the, the, the greatest consumers of your, your service. Um, I'm going to talk about Eon in a minute, which is an energy company. There the lead users are harder to find because they're generally the people who use the least electricity, so they're, kind of, they're not as easy to spot in your, 
in your, uh, in your data. But, so Virtual Atlantic were aware, a bit like Lego, of an online community of 30,000 uh, um, flyers. Uh, it was called BFlyer, and people paid 50 pounds a year, or $50 a year, I think, to become a member of this community. And they sought very geeky information about stuff like where's the best place to sit on the plane if I want to get fed early and then get some sleep on the flight to New York. Uh, so the kind of stuff that I, as somebody who doesn't fly that often, I wouldn't pay 50 quid a year to, to join that sort of community. But if you're traveling every week, which, uh, or, or more often, which many of these people are, then that is really valuable information to you. And so one of the things that we learned through this project is that these frequent flyers, perhaps not so, so, too surprisingly, fly more often than um, the, the innovation team that works for Virgin. So your customers know more about your product and service than you do, which is massively counterintuitive, but um, it's kind of silly not to, to, to ask them in and help them innovate with you. So to cut a very long story short, we developed a whole bunch of social media applications. There's a flight tracker on the right, had a million downloads. Uh, the taxi sharing scheme, bottom left, uh, less successful but really, really nice concept uh, based upon the fact that Within any plane of about 300 people, you have all kinds of overlapping social networks, and so there are um, all kinds of products and services you can, yeah, you can develop on the back of that, the first of which is this taxi sharing scheme that's now been rolled out. But most importantly, from a commercial point of view, is this was developed at about 10% of the cost of had it been developed uh, in-house within Virgin. So open innovation, I think, at its best, is about doing things better, cheaper, and faster, and I think this is a quick example of that. Uh, the next thing which is difficult for many large organisations is, to, um, is to, gi to give up control, to trust your external partners and community to do the heavy lifting. And uh, I mentioned Eon earlier, so we ran a, a competition with them called Power to the People, and this was all around kind of big £10 million uh, um, propositions around uh, um, energy efficiency, broadly speaking. Uh, it was more specific than that, but, um, uh, but, but, but we launched the website on a Friday afternoon. Uh, a lot of work had gone into that, and so our clients have logged off for the day once we'd done that. And then on Monday morning, uh, we had thousands, oh, uh, hundreds, I think five, 500 plus ideas submitted to the site. And the client phoned me up saying, you know, I, I can't possibly uh, engage with or judge or, or uh, 500 or so ideas. We were a bit, she was a bit blown away by uh, the, the level of uh, kind of response, as were we. We hadn't expected quite so much. Uh, but I think the trick here, as is within any sort of crowdsourcing style online environment, is to is to let the let the community do the do, do the hard work in terms of ranking, voting, figuring out what are the interesting propositions. So you're maybe not you might make the final casting vote, as in kind of uh, Simon Cowell, etc., in the X Factor. But uh, but you know the public or the community is 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 letting the cream rise, and that is. Um, that is difficult to do, especially for large organisations that are used to controlling everything themselves traditionally. Um, the next point, it sounds almost too obvious to even state it, but again and again, um, people start with a really boring and lengthy strategy document which kind of makes no sense to anybody, uh, not least themselves. Uh, so um, an example I like to use here comes from working with Orange. Where, um, well, two examples here actually on the same chart. One is we ran a competition with them last year called Mobile Volunteering. The, uh, the challenge here was how can people do good in three minutes or less using their mobile phone? Uh, which I thought was a pretty interesting question. We were targeting this at charities, large and small, but also kind of geeks and apps developers. So two very different communities, but sort of unified by an interesting <coughs> question. That led to a launch of an app called Do Some Good, which launched a couple of months ago, and David Cameron has said nice things about it, and Orange are very happy. Um, the, the other project we ran with them uh, when we were back at Nesta, uh, we were looking for the next Orange Wednesdays, which is this two-for-one film deal that Orange have. And uh, I'm sure many of you know that, or many of you probably do this anyway, uh, it costs companies like Orange a huge amount of money, because about 25% of their customers jump between networks and, and different deals. Uh, every year. So anything like Orange Wednesdays that can attract customers or keep customers uh, is a good thing and very valuable to them. So we were looking for the next Orange Wednesdays and we found them a company called Last Second Tickets, which was a successful company in its own right, trading about £6 million a year. Uh, and a very, very long story, but Orange finally acquired that company very recently. It's piloted the service with a million customers in Manchester and Liverpool, and it's now uh, going to be rolling that out nationally very soon. So it's created, again, a big new £20 million pound service proposition through uh, a kind of a small scale kind of pilot. So rather than trying to invent everything yourself, 
uh, partner with you know, smart companies like the second ticket or, or the spin brush example that, uh, that Mike talked about. And then my final kind of example and my final quote, excuse me, I'm kind of parched, I'll just have a quick drink. I love this quote from J.G. Ballard, namely, the future reveals itself through the peripheral. And uh, I think uh, increasingly organizations, your competition comes from left field, it often comes from outside of your uh, sector of expertise, uh, but turning that on its head, thereby your greatest opportunity for innovation might be outside of your core domain of expertise as well. So I think IDEO talk about recruiting T-shaped people, I think we need uh, by which they mean a, a depth of expertise and a breadth of uh, a breadth of expertise simultaneously. I think we need more T-shaped organisations, and that's what we try and work with. So my favourite example here is a project we did in McLaren, Formula One racing company, uh, where we brought together a diverse group of companies, one of whom was the National Air Traffic Control Service uh, in the UK, and McLaren was basically showcasing its technology. Uh, which was mostly bits of car, bits of engine and bits of carbon fibre. But, but at the end of the day, almost as an afterthought, they wheeled out a computer and a bit of software, and they said, oh, we've developed this quite clever predictive software technology that we use in our races, and it pulls in data about the weather and about the driver and about other cars, and we make decisions in real time based on lots of different data inputs about when to overtake and, and what tyres to use and all that kind of stuff that they have to do. And at that point, Peter Tomkinson, who's the guy on the right-hand side of the image, his, his kind of ears pricked up and he revealed something quite interesting, slight, quite scary as well, which is in an airport like Heathrow, Heathrow is such a complex system of planes in the sky, planes on the ground, the crew, passengers, uh, catering, uh, the, the works, um, that they're having to make kind of uh, predictions uh, all the time, um, and their current predictive capability is only about 10 minutes into the future, beyond which the kind of error bars on their, on their model, on their computational model, is so great that it's basically anybody's guess. And so what all airports do, not just Heathrow, is they engineer massive inefficiencies into the system so they have everything on standby in case it's required, which is obviously ridiculous. Um, McLaren software, at least back in the fact packet calculation, promised a two-hour predictive uh, window uh, for air traffic controllers, which would enable an airport to strip out huge redundancy in the, the complex system that is an airport. And again, it's a very long story, but that's now being piloted in Heathrow and Hong Kong airports, and McLaren and Nats have entered a joint venture, and they conservatively estimate the market for this to be in the billions of dollars. Sadly, I, I own no stake in that business, else I may not be here today. But, but I think, for me, this is interesting because uh, McLaren and Nats are you know, completely different industries, have almost no reason to talk to each other, let alone work together. And so I think often your biggest opportunity, as well as your biggest threat, can come from left field, so you need that peripheral vision. So, so these are the lessons learned. Not all the smart people work for you. Um, engage your top 1%. Um, trust the community to do the heavy lifting. Ask interesting questions and develop your peripheral vision. And I'll just finish with a nice quote from Howard Reingold, who I think was part of this uh, Silicon Valley trip that Rory started off talking about with Reid Hoffman a couple of years ago. Um, he talked about more people pulling more resources in new ways being the history of civilization. And I think at the moment there are buzzwords like co-creation and open innovation. It will almost certainly be replaced with different buzzwords in a few years' time. But I think this move towards a greater openness, a greater sharing, uh, a, a greater sort of need for collaboration will only increase. And so I think I will leave it there. Thank you very much. <laughs>